think it's time to start. Welcome to the first colloquium of this new year. Today we have a great honor and privilege to host Professor Andrzej Henel, who is related to our faculty since, as I learned, 1966, so almost 60 years of history. He's become a, an expert on solid state physics, but also a very important academic teacher, important for, for many generations of us. He's an author of two books of exercises, I guess most of, of us, which worked on and studied in, in our first years. And he also uh, initiated uh, individual studies on math and natural science, which we know as MISMAP, and was a coordinator of these studies for some years. And now he's a teaching, uh, an academic teacher at the Open University. And today we will uh, hear his talk of, about Josef Rothblatt. Please. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. And thank you very much for invitation. I checked my notes and I found that uh, on this conservatory, I presented first time lecture on tunnel microscopy, Nobel Prize on tunnel microscopy in 1986. That means uh, 37 years ago. Professor Pnieski asked me to, to talk about tunnel microscopy. Later, uh, I have written two articles about uh, the Soviet spy Klaus Fuchs, who was in Los Alamos, and about Stanislav Ulam, who strongly participated in the building of the hydrogen bomb. And Professor Janusz Zakrzewski invited me in 1991 to present a lecture on this conservatory. And the, the title of the lecture was Bomb Spies and Scientists. And this title became several years later, became the title of my one semester lecture at Open University of Warsaw University. And this lecture was a great success. It was repeated several times, even now it's on the way. And one of the heroes of this lecture was Josef Rothblatt. And that's the way going to, to, to today's lecture. Josef Rothblatt obtained PhD in physics on Warsaw University in 1938 and Peace Nobel Prize in 1995. However, until now, he still remains uh, extremely unknown person on the list of Polish prize winners. Official Polish prize winners list contains of seven persons and very rarely uh, Rodblad arrives here. Uh, I would like to emphasize that Maria Sklodowska Kiri which all Poles consider as a Pole, is from the French point of view, this is their Nobel Prize winner. They put her body with body of Pierre Curie to Pantheon. Also the same is with Czesław Miłosz. He was professor at Berkeley when he obtained Nobel Prize. And the United States keeps him on his list of Nobel Prize winners, but also Lithuania. He was born in Lithuania. So very often it happens that Nobel Prize winner has several 
countries uh, which are proud of him. In the case of Broadblood, he always used to say that I'm a Pole with British passport. He took this passport uh, in 46. So I consider that it's very sad he, he's not arriving on this list. If we go to London, on the corner of Great Russell Street and Barry Place, you can find the table, Sir Joseph Rodblat, one of the Poland's finest sons, sons work here. If you go to Warsaw, you can find since 2018, Józef uh, Rodblat Square. Uh, just now, uh, Dean Darek Basik told me that there is a table somewhere in this area about Józef Rodblat. However, I quickly was, was searching quickly I didn't found the photo of this table. I will check this later. Anyway, if you go to Krakowskie Przedmieście, Auditorium Maximum, you find a table devoted to Rodblad from 2016. It's very difficult to, to photograph this table because uh, I, I tried to do it. This is not my photo, this is even better. Uh, anyway, everyone being in auditorium maximum can see it. Okay, uh, so these are the places where you can find some information about Rodblad. If you go to the Department of Physics, Warsaw University, there is still nothing. But I hope that maybe it will improve. Uh, going to Rodblad's life. He was born in Warsaw at Miwa Street in Muranów. He was a child of Scheindla and Zelman Rodblad. His father had a transport company and a horse breeding business. During World War I, in, in the middle of 1915, German army came to Warsaw and the horses were confiscated and the company went bankrupt. Rodblad was obliged uh, to start to work as quickly as possible. He graduated from the craft school as an electrician and he was working seriously with his brother as an electrician. But he still wanted to study and the, study physics and the only possibility was to study in the evenings and uh, having no money it must be uh, it must be free and Wolna Wszechnica Polska was giving the, him this opportunity he obtained master's degree in physics in 1932. In 1934, he married uh, Hadassah Grin, named Tola. She was born in Lublin and uh, graduated in Polish studies at Warsaw University in 33, being 20 years old. Rodbert was also our student because in November 32 he was admitted to the first year of studies at Wydział Humanistyczny. A special one-year pedagogical course, course gave him the right to teach physics in secondary schools. Then, until January 34, he attended also lectures on philosophy, psychology, logic, at Wydział Humanistyczny. Among others, lectures by Władysław 
Tatarkiewicz and Tadeusz Kotarbiński. If you go to Sinadeckich 8, you find two tables, one about Towarzystwo Naukowe Warszawskie and the second about Pracownia Radiologiczna Towarzystwa Naukowego Warszawskiego. Pracownia was organized from 1912 and the honorary director was Maria skłodowska -Kiri. Real one at the beginning was Dr. Jan Kazimierz Danysz, father of Professor Marian Danysz. Unfortunately, being French citizen, he was taken to army and killed uh, on uh, battle. The next director was Professor Ludwig Wertenstein, who was also a student of Maria Skłodowska Kiri. The assistants there were Josef Rodblad and Marian Danisch. And Wertenstein was real supervisor of Rodblad's PhD thesis. He was preparing at Pracownia Radiologiczna. They were unable to give him this title. So in October 10, 38, he obtained a doctoral degree at Wydział Matematyczno-Przyrodniczy of Warsaw University, and his official supervisor was Professor Stefan Pinkowski. The title of dissertation, Research on Neutron Disintegration Processes Using an Ionization Chamber and the Hoffman Electrometer. The defense was not easy. Exam plus defense continued six hours. Anyway, he passed. This is the diploma. As you can see, uh, Rector Włodzimierz Antoniewicz, Dean Wacław Roszkowski, and promoter, supervisor Stefan Pienkowski. Since April 39, he obtained scholarship in England, in Liverpool, the laboratory of James Chadwick, Nobel Prize winner. In August 39, he came to pick up his wife. And they make a tragic mistake. Tola was not feeling well after the appendix surgery and insisted on postponing the trip. She was also not ready to leave her parents. He left alone and never saw her again. After beginning of the war, they need a few months to, to, to establish contact. They will try to evacuate her to England, first to Denmark. Chadwick asked Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr was ready to send invitation, but in April, Germans attacked Denmark. Another possibility was through Italy. They have family, Teppi's family in Italy. They sent invitation. Tola obtained Italian visa and British visa. Rodblad claimed that she was already in the train. But at June 10, 40, Italy declared war against England and that was finished. She left Warsaw. She was with her family in Lublin and they all died in concentration camp in Bozes, probably in 42. Rothblatt was not aware that his wife died until the end of the war. It was also a dramatic moment in physics. December 22, 38, Hahn and Strassmann were bombarding uranium with neutrons, which leads to the creation of elements lighter, twice lighter than uranium, including barium and lanthanum. They published results 
without explanation, only results. In February 1839, Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch explained this as a uranium nuclear fission. That was, as we just know very well, very crucial point in the history of physics. Before depart to England, in February and March, Rothblatt was looking for neutrons emitting, emitted during fusion of uranium. He published a letter in Nature in May 39, emission of neutrons accompanying the fusion of uranium nuclei. He was not the first. Two months earlier, French group von Halban, Joliot-Curie and Kowarski published first results on the subject, liberation of neutrons in the nuclear explosion of uranium. Anyway, it was the subject he really strongly think about. And he claimed that being in England, he was the first to propose the construction of a bomb. It's his quote, unfortunately, I was the first to invent this bomb. Maybe he was not the first, I think, that many physicists could think about it. Anyway, he presented his calculation to Chadwick in November. And Chadwick was to convey this to Churchill. In March 40, uh, another physicist from Germany is, who escaped to England from Germany, Frisch and Peirst, presented memorandum about possibility of building atomic bomb from about five kilograms of uranium. Chadwick thought highly of Rothblatt. In 40, in a letter to Cockcroft, he wrote, I don't know if you met Rothblatt, a Pole who has been here about nine months. He is extremely able man, one of the best I have come across for some years. After memorandum of Frisch and Peirs, uh, English government uh, started to really work very seriously. In created, they created in April 40, MOD Committee. MOD, it was not acronym, it was the name of babysitter of Bohr children. Uh, the program name was Tube Alloys, and research was Take, taken at four universities, Birmingham, Liverpool, Oxford, and Cambridge. Their re, re, long report sent to USA in summer 41 concluded with information an effective uranium bomb could be constructed that would contain about 25 pounds of active material. Between people who signed were, of course, Chadwick and Rothblatt, Frisch and Peirce, and unfortunately, Klaus Fuchs. Klaus Fuchs is a German, it was a German physicist who contacted the Soviet embassy and was transferring all the information to Russia. In the United States, everything started, of course, with this famous letter, Einstein to Roosevelt. However, at the beginning, it was only discussion. After Pearl Harbor, really, it started seriously. And in June 42, Roosevelt approved a detailed program to build an atomic bomb with a budget of 85 million. In fact, it was 2 billion but at the beginning, 85 million. The Manhattan Engineer District was established, and on September, Colonel Leslie Groves was appointed general and a chief. It was a guy who built Pentagon, so they were sure it's somebody who, who can do it. In August 33, Winston Churchill and Roosevelt m met in Quebec, and they agreed that the bomb would be made in the USA. 
most English physicists left there in December 43. Uh, all the German uh, physicists who escaped to England, they immediately took British citizenship. Free spares, folks, etc., etc. Rothblatt refused to change his citizenship and the Americans blocked his departure. Chadwick intervened with groups and finally Rothblatt was the only person allowed to go to Los Alamos with Polish passport. Uh, von Halman and Kowarski, two collaborators of Joliet Curie, they worked as a part of the Manhattan Project in Montreal, but they were never allowed to go to Los Angeles. And it's a photo from, from Los Alamos. Everyone has documents with photographs, letter and, and two numbers. FBI was looking for spies at, at, in Los Alamos very seriously. They checked the correspondence, phones, etc., but they missed Clark Fuchs. On the other hand, Rothblatt turned to be out the perfect candidate for a spy. He signed up for a Sunday aviation course in Santa Fe. And they decided that he definitely want to return to Europe, join the RAF, fly to Poland, parachute out and pass on nuclear secrets to Russians. And there was very big file about Rothblatt at the FBI. Also, they claimed that he had communist views. Moreover, they attributed communist views to people he was meeting. In November 1944, this is Rothblatt original text. One day, Chadwick came to Los Alamos and told me that he had just received an intelligence report showing that the Germans had given up on building the bomb. It was not exactly true. They have found Heisenberg group, but they were not aware that in East Germany there is the second group, which was working even in 45, until the, the last days before Russian arrives. But from this side, from the side of Heisenberg, it was true. When he told me this, I replied, that I gave up further work on building the bomb. Some people claim that he was the first. It was not exactly like this. Edward Condon left Los Alamos after six weeks. I only want to say that in my case found that the extreme concert with security was morbidly depressing. But he was working again on Manhattan Project, but outside Los Alamos. Felix Bloch was, was not satisfied with his work in Los Alamos, and he left and joined Radar Group at Harvard. But if we talk about moral arguments, Lisa Meitner, the mother of the bomb, the person who first understood this, Max Born, and several others, refused strongly to work with the bomb from the beginning. In 1985, uh, Rodblatt has written an article to Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist explaining his story, his moral arguments. There is such a funny figure. You can see bomb being built from wood and the guy who's leaving. Uh, one thing is surprising. He recounted that during the, his travel from Washington to New York, all my documents went missing. As a matter of fact, 
there, are, there is a large of number of his personal papers from Los Alamos, archived now at the Churchill Archive Center. So something is not true. Maybe after 40 years, he, he forgot something. He returned to England, became director of research in nuclear physics at Liverpool. He was afraid to go to Poland because probably he will be taken immediately to Siberia like many German physicists to work on Russian bomb. And to his surprise, he learned that most of this family survived. And he was able to take, uh, to brought the surviving part of the family, including mother, brother, and sister, who is their family, to England. They escaped from ghetto and hid in Otfotsk. Unfortunately, he learned that his wife did not survive. He started uh, some activity. He co-founded the Atomic Scientists Association and they organized the Atom Train. It was an exhibition that toured Britain uh, and then later Europe and Middle East. But everything started... Ah, he also moved to London. He became professor of physics in the Bartholomew Hospital. It was a teaching hospital attached to the University of London. And there he worked until 76, until his retirement. Uh, he was also editor-in-chief of physics in medicine and biology, and he dealt with impact on radiation on living organisms. But everything seriously started with Castle Bravo. This is, you can say, beautiful, you can say terrible, but this is in the first moments after Castle Bravo explosion. It was Ulam Teller bomb with 400 kilograms of lithium deuteride exploded at the artificial island on Bikini in the March 1st, 1554. It was called shrimp because it looked like this. A four meter long, one meter and a little bit high. 10 tons. They calculate efficiency about four to six megatons. Fireball had seven kilometers, crater two kilometers, mushroom 14. They anticipation reactions, so-called jetter cycle. That means deuterium plus tritium is giving neutron and alpha particle and a lot of energy. Lithium-6 plus neutron is giving tritium and alpha particle. Tritium goes there, neutron goes there. Anyway, uh, there was a big error. Final result it was 15 megatons. It turned out that the reaction with lithium-6 took place, but surprise came from lithium-7. After absorbing neutron, lithium-8 was created, which was to decay into beryllium and then to alpha particles that, that they expected. Lithium-7 also decayed into tritium and alpha particles. In total, more tritium and more neutrons were created. Castle Bravo caused ecological disaster. White dust fell on Japanese cutter, American aircraft carrier, and Marshall Islands. In totally 15 square kilometers were polluted 
American government paid millions of compensations to local Japanese, Japanese, Japanese fishermen and sailors. And that was the beginning of Rothblatt's serious public activity. He appeared on British TV, declared that US information were, was false. He explained what a hydrogen bomb is, that it's many times more powerful, and its purity is untrue. He received information about the pollution from Japanese and published in press. What happened? The bomb was to be two-stage bomb. Plutonium bomb, igniting hydrogen bomb. However, it was coated with uranium-238 to reflect X-rays. The large number of neutrons created three-stage bomb. Fission, fusion, fission. And the fission of uranium caused massive pollution. His paper contributed to public debate that resulted the partial nuclear test ban treaty in Moscow in 63. As you can imagine, uh, many security services started to be very in interested with with Rod Blood, and I checked as CIA and FBI uh, archives in United, in United States, his papers are still confidential. However, I have found FBI files, files in England, and they are from 50 to 68. They still were suspicious of cooperation with Klaus Fuchs, which never existed. Also, our security started to file Physics One, Physics One. I have found it in IPN, and they wanted to recruit Rodblad to obtain secret information, but the results were completely negative. One thing is funny. Officer Henrik Bombel from the Warsaw Security Office visited Professor Pniewski and discussed with him about Rothblatt. Professor Pniewski, talking about the Rothblatt family, spent a long time talking about Rothblatt himself, calling him a man, man of crystal character due to the help Pniewski received it, being in England. I heard also similar opinions from the two, two physicists, our colleagues, Zbigniew Gortel and Viktor Niedzicki, who met Rothblatt at scientific conferences. Going back to great politics, after Bravo story, Bernard Russell, decided to write his famous manifesto. And it's known as Russell Einstein Manifesto. As a matter of fact, Einstein was very ill. He received this manifesto a few days before his death. He signed it. The text was written by Russell and Rothblatt. Officially, it was announced, the appeal for discernment was announced in July 55, with 11 signatures, between them Rothblatt, Infeld, Max Born, Frederick Kiri, Linus Pauling, Hideki Yukawa. And that was the beginning of Pagwash movement. Pagwash Conference on Science and World Problems was founded in 57 by Rothblatt and Russell. In Pagwash, Nova Scotia, in Canada. Russell was unable to, he was too ill, unable to, to come. So finally, it was Rothblatt to, who organized this. At the first conference, there were 22 scientists from US, from Soviet Union, from Japan, UK, Canada, Australia, Austria, France, China, and Poland, Marian Danish. Since then, over four, 60 conferences 
had been held until now. The, the proceedings are secret. All the talks during the conference are secret. Speeches are not published. Only final documents are published. In the years 57-73, Radulat was the Secretary General of Pagwash. In the years 88-97, he was President. Pagwash's main objective was the elimination of all weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological, and of war as social institution to settle international disputes. It provided background to the Partial Test Ban Treaty 63, Non Proliferation Treaty 68, Anti Ballistic Missile Treaty 72, Biological Weapons Convention 62, Chemical Weapons Convention 93. Former US Secretary of Defense McNamara credited Back Channel Pugwash Initiative with laying the groundwork for the negotiation which ended the Vietnam War. There are several Poles who were active in Pagwash, of course Radblad, but also Infeld, Danish, Kotar Biński, Adam Daniel Rothfeld, still active until now, Maciej Nałęcz, Ignacy Małecki, Leszek Kuźnicki and others. There are negative opinions about Pagwash, and we cannot forget it. Many people believe that Pagwash was a forum for Soviet propaganda. The conference in Poland in 82 during martial law was particularly unfortunate. It was planned in advance, and such complications were not expected. They really tried to not to notice the surrounding reality. And Pagwash management, Rodblat and the president, visited General Jaruzelski, which Polish TV eagerly took advantage of. They show them, etc., etc. Also, Sakharov, who was at that time in Gorki, sent a letter to participant, which did not become official document but on the conference. Many people criticized this. Apparently, it was discussed in closed sessions. In general, Pagwash did not deal with human rights in either USSR, Poland, or China. If we ask about Rodblad, his assistant called his boss a moral idealistic visionary he recalled that every time the creator of Pagwash was accused of naivety, he calmly replied that the conversation was the only way for humanity to survive, that everything possible must be done to the pursuit of elimination, eliminating all nuclear, nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, formation about Nobel nominations are with the 50 years limit. And they don't, don't keep this. Only literature prize is regularly every year publishing the next one. For Peace Nobel Prize, they stop at 71 until now. There are some, some nominations I found, two in 63, one in 64, 68, 69, 70. Probably there are much more in the following years. Anyway, they received Nobel Peace Prize in 95. It was awarded jointly to Joseph Rothblatt and Pagwash Conference 50-50 for their efforts to diminish the part played by nuclear arms in international politics and in the longer run to eliminate such arms. 
uh, chairman of the Norwegian, Norwegian Novel Committee in presentation speech uh, said between, it was a long speech, the Pagwash movement probably played not a significant part in the process which led to such important arms limitation agreements as the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty 63, non proliferation 68, SALT 1, and the Convention on Biological Weapons 72. Through its unvarying long-term efforts, it has also been a major contribution to the change of mentality so essential in the nuclear disarmament that has taken place since the end of the Cold War, start one and start two, and the agreement to make the non-prefilation treaty permanent have meant a significant reduction to the nuclear threat. Rothblatt presented his lecture. I have chosen only a few sentences. I participated at the most senior level in the World War, Manhattan Project, that produced the first atomic bomb, weapons. Now at age 88, I am, I am one of the few remaining such senior papers alive. Looking back at the half century since that time, I feel the most in intense relief that these weapons have not been used since World War II. In some countries, nuclear weapons development still continues. Accordingly, I call all, on all scientists in all countries to cease in the, and desist from work creating, developing, improving, and manufacturing further nuclear weapons, and for that matter, other weapons of potential mass destruction, such as chemical and biolog biological weapons. In Poland, the price for Rothblatt uh, was not very well accepted. In Gazeta Wyborcza, they have written that global stability is threatened today not by the nuclear warheads, but by tanks, Iraqi tanks in Kuwait, Serb Serbian tanks in Sarajevo, Russian tanks in Grozny. The award should go to the Russian biophysicists and dissidents Sergei Kovalev, who fought against the Kremlin imperial aspirations and the peace and security of our part of the world depend largely whether he succeed. Our colleague, Professor Łukasz Turski, has written in Tygodnik Powszechny uh, article Niezasłużona Nagroda. He, he used mainly these arguments I told before about this Pagwash meeting 82. It was in 1995, I thought that after, that after a quarter of a century, maybe opinion of Professor Turski will soften. soften. However, in 21, there was strong discussion at Facebook between Turski and Mrówczyński, and Turski was as sure as in 95. However, I have understood that he was, he did not realize important matter. He has written at Facebook, while Pagwash petting the dragon could be explained in the 50s, circa Cuban missile crisis, in 82, the threat of nuclear war was just a peer move by the Kremlin. And that's important error. He, he doesn't know about Operation Ryan. Yuri Andropov, chief of KGB, had idea, obsession, that Soviet Union will be attacked like Hitler attacked in the 40s. Radiernoje Jadiernoje Napadnienie, Operation Ryan, 
nuclear missile attack. And he started this after election of Ronald Reagan. As we know, in 1982, Brezhnev died and Andropov took all power. Since August, he was already in hospital till the death, but he was still governing from the hospital. What was Operation Ryan? Soviet agents at the West were to look for evidence of NATO preparation to attack. They were given a list of 20 tasks that had to be performed. Some were quite abstruse. Checking the stock of blood banks, observing the whereabouts of nuclear decision makers, including important bankers and heads of churches. But the worst came in November. In November, NATO organized able archer staff exercises. That means no soldier left the base. Everything one was on communication. The exercise plus, including the response of NATO forces, blue, to the attack of Warsaw Pact forces, orange. On Yugoslavia, then Finland, Norway, and Greece. The blues put 40,000 soldiers on alert. As the stimulated conflict developed, state of alert was announced for units equipped with nuclear weapons. The aim of the exercise was to examine, examine the procedure from switching from conventional to nuclear weapons under the influence of or integrations and analyze several steps and up to Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And there was a panic in the in USSR. Andropov and his entourage were really in panic. It was concluding that it's the beginning of World War III. In addition, the date of the exercises correspond to the October Revolution, November 7. Finally, the stage of alarm was introduced in armies of the Warsaw Pact. The planes were armed with nuclear weapons. Missiles were ready to launch missiles. It was extremely danger moment nobody was aware of. Fortunately, the head of KGB in London, Colonel Oleg Gordievsky, was a MI6 agent. He immediately notified the M MI6. They notified Margaret Thatcher. She called Reagan. The decision was made to end exercises quickly. Operation Ryan continued even after the death of Andropov. During the time of Chernenko, Gorbachev closed this. And Gorbachev wrote in his memories, perhaps never in the post-war period has the situation in the world been so explosive and therefore more difficult and more unfavorable than in the first half of 80s. During the Cuban crisis, we were all aware of, because it was public, this crisis was very secret, but it was really very dangerous. At the end, I would like to make a short comparison to Andrei Sakharov, which is considered by many people as a great hero. Sakharov built the bomb for Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev. During 20 years, in the premissile times before Sputnik, he proposed to make 100 megaton underwater explosion near the shores of the United States and completely destroy Washington, New York, Boston with gigantic tsunami wave. At that time, they were not following his idea, but currently Russia is testing 100 ton unmanned submarine Poseidon torpedo it's to have nuclear engine, 24 meters long, 
speed about 100 kilometers per hour, two megaton bomb operate in a depth less than 100 meters. Saharov also built Tsar bomb for, for Khrushchev. It was three-stage bomb, 27 tons, 58 megatons. The plan was 100, but uranium armor was omitted. They took lead or tungsten. It was dropped from 10 kilometers at Novaya Zemlya in October 61, exploded at four kilometers, mushroom cloud at 40, 64 kilometers, fireball nine kilometers. If we compare, you can see this is Mount Everest, then Hiroshima, and this is mushroom cloud from the Tsar bomb. Recently, I have found information uh, coming from Valentin Fallin. He was advisor of Gromyko, ambassador in Germany, and secretary of Central Committee. Saharov generally suggested not to serve Washington strategy of ruining the Soviet Union with arms race. He advocated the placement of nuclear weapons of 100 megatons each, each along the Atlantic and Pacific coast of the United States. And in case of aggression against us or our friends, press the buttons. So finally, I would say Saharov built hydrogen bombs for 20 years and then fought for peace for 20 years. In the case of Rothblatt, sorry, there is an error I see, built the atomic bomb for six years and fought for peace for 60 years. At the end, I would like to show you a short film with Rothblatt. Uh, if I remember this meeting, it was just here uh, on 100 years of Hoja. Some of our friends, which left Poland, they had really problems to use Polish after a few years. I'm surprised you will see how Rodblat, Rodblat is speaking uh, Polish in 2009. Najmniej znany noblista. Urodził się przed pierwszą wojną światową w Warszawie, w ubogiej dzielnicy miasta, na Dzielnej. W dzieciństwie poznał, co to bieda i głód. Kończy szkołę rzemieślniczą przy ulicy Stawki. Dziś Józef Rodblat mieszka w Londynie. Jest profesorem uniwersyteckim. Doktoraty honoris causa. Tytuł szlachecki nadany przez Królową Anglii. Jest członkiem Królewskiego Towarzystwa Naukowego założonego 350 lat temu. Odpowiednika naszego panu. Pracuje naukowo i działa w ruchu Pagłosz. Gabinet profesora wygląda, no, jak przystało na prawdziwego naukowca. Ojciec zawsze marzył o tym, że ja w ogóle robił studia wyższe. Ale niestety warunki finansowe na to nie pozwoliły. I koniecznie było, żebym ja zaczął zarabiać na swoje życie, jak tylko możliwe było. I dlatego poszedłem do szkoły rzemieślniczej, w której się uczyłem, nauczyłem trochę elektrotechniki. Trzy lata tej szkoły i od razu po szkole zacząłem pracować. Ale zawsze chciałem nadal dojść do, do nauki. Wobec tego zacząłem się uczyć sam. To był, to był dość ciężki okres, cały dzień pracować fizycznie bardzo często, pracować, żeby zarobić na życie, a wieczorami czytać książki, uczyć się. Ktoś mi powiedział, że istnieje w Warszawie instytucja, wyższa uczelnia, gdzie nie, nie wymagają matury, a, a i też nauczanie jest wieczorami. Instytucja prawie jest zrobiona dla mnie. Ta uczelnia była wolna wszechnica polska. Matura zdaje eksternistycznie. Pracuje naukowo jako asystent w pracowni radiologicznej przy ulicy Śniadeckich 8. W sierpniu 1939 roku wyjeżdża na stypendium do Liverpoolu. Tuż przed moim wyjazdem do Anglii Coś ważnego zaszło, coś ważnego w nauce, 
coś ważnego w moim życiu. Czytałem pracę nową, odkrycie fisji neutronów, rozszczepienia neutronów. I po czytaniu tej pracy wykonałem pewne doświadczenia, które doprowadziły mnie do wniosku, że jest, po raz pierwszy jest możliwość wykorzystania energii zawartej w jądrze atomowym. Od listopada 1999 roku ja zacząłem pracę nad bombą atomową w Liverpoolu. Później się dołączyli do tego inni uczeni w Anglii. I, i w roku 1961 myśmy doszli do wniosku, że bomba atomowa może istnieć. Część naukowców rozpocznie pracę w amerykańskim ośrodku badań jądrowych w Los Alamos. To najsilniej strzeżona tajemnica Armii Stanów Zjednoczonych. Tu powstawała bomba atomowa. Ja był jeden z tych, którzy został zaproszony. Warunek był, że to, mu, że to muszą być e, angielscy obywatele, obywatele muszą być obywatelstwo angielskie. I wobec tego moi koledzy, niektórzy z nich, którzy byli z, z Niemiec, z Szwajcarii, z innych krajów, oni wszystko nagle przyjęli obywatelstwo e, angielskie. Ja powiedziałem nie, dlatego że ja miałem zam, zawsze zamiar wrócić do, do Polski po wojnie. Profesor Chadwick, przełożony Rodblata, przekonał szefa badań nuklearnych generała Grousa. Amerykanie ustąpili. Zatrudnią polskiego obywatela. Wywiad naukowy musiał wysoko cenić talent i dotychczasowe osiągnięcia młodego naukowca z Warszawy. W połowie 1944 roku Rodblat uzmysławia sobie grozę doświadczeń. To już nie przeciw Niemcom szykowano bombę. Postanawia opuścić ośrodek. Z jakiegoś powodu e, służby bezpieczeństwa w tym Los Alamos, doszedł do wniosku, że ja chcę wrócić do Anglii po to, ażeby się włączyć do Royal Air Force i jakoś dostać samolot, który przywiezie mnie do, do, do Polski, do, do tego obszaru zajętego w tym czasie przez, przez Rosjanów, z ochronem spaść na to i, i wszystko po to, ażeby dać tajemnicę broni atomowej dla, dla, dla Sowietów. Władze amerykańskie zgodziły się na mój wyjazd pod warunkiem, że ja nie będę miał żadnego kontaktu z moimi kolegami, którzy pracowali nad Manhattan Project. Ostatni odcinek podróży. Wsiada do pociągu w Waszyngtonie. Kiedy dojechał do Nowego Jorku, zniknął cały jego bagaż. Służby specjalne wolą nie ryzykować. Aż do sierpnia 1945 roku nie miałem pojęcia, co się dzieje z tym projektem. Głęboko odczuł tragedię Hiroshima. Włącza się do ruchu przeciwników zagrożenia nuklearnego. Organizuje objazdowe wystawy, publikuje. Ja wiedziałem, że ta pierwsza broń atomowa to jest tylko początek w tej, tej dziedzinie, że broń tysiąc razy mocniejsza, ta broń wodorowa, a to bomba, bomba, bomba wodorowa, od razu już wtedy już na tym pracowali. I obawiałem się, że jeżeli Amerykanie, jeżeli Amerykanie nadal będą pracowali na tym i Rosjanie oczywiście też będą próbowali swój bomby zrobić, dojdzie do wyścigu z broni. I tego się bardzo bałem, że to mogło doprowadzić do końca cywilizacji i do końca nawet ludzkości. W roku 55 Bertrand Russell i Albert Einstein ogłaszają słynny manifest wzywający do powstrzymania zbrojeń nuklearnych. Podpisało go 11 najwybitniejszych uczonych świata. Poproszono o podpis również Rodblata. Organizuje pierwszą konferencję 27 intelektualistów w Kanadzie, w małej miejscowości Pagłosz. Stąd nazwa ruchu, który stworzy platformę spotkań naukowców z obu stron żelaznej kurtyny. Poświęci tej idei całe swoje życie. Nadal pracuje naukowo w Londynie i w Liverpoolu. Doktoraty honoris causa. Członkostwo w Akademii Nauk. Tytuł szlachecki nadany przez królową Elżbietę II. I uhonorowanie działalności na rzecz pokoju i życia naszej planety. Był to piątek 13 października 1995 roku, kiedy telefon dzwonił z Oslo z wiadomością, że mnie przyznali Nagrodę Nobla razem z ruchem Pag Pagwoszu. Czystość wręczania w obecności króla Norwegii odbyła się w Oslo. Po 
pokojową Nagrodę Nobla przyznano ruchowi Pagłosz i osobno indywidualnie Józefowi Rodblatowi. Tradycyjny bankiet na cześć noblisty. Zabrali głos ówczesny przewodniczący Rady Pagłosz, profesor Maciej Nałęcz i profesor Rodblat. Na prośbę laureata wykonano preludium Chopina i utwór Pendereckiego. Tak ser Józef Rodblat przypomniał światu, że czuje się Polakiem. Ma 95 lat, nadal pracuje i działa w ruchu Pagłosz. W dniu, kiedy realizowaliśmy zdjęcia, nadeszło zaproszenie. Od Królowej na obiad do Buckingham Palace. Yeah, he is two, 20 years older than me, and I would like really to be, be in such a form in 20 years. Anyway, uh, the end, uh, very end. He died in London two years after this film. Uh, at the end, I would like to uh, oh, I would like to show you there are three books about Rodblad, if you are interested. The best one is uh, Marek Gordikowski, Noblista Nowolipek. Uh, in book of Sławomir Koper, there are several uh, people. There's only one chapter about Rodblad, not Bliści se Skandaliści. And recently, Joanna Roszak published a book about Juraj Torygami. And at the end of this talk, I have my wish. I really think that it's worth to remember about Józef Rodblad, and you should be proud of him. And my wish, I would like to see at the Faculty of Physics of the Warsaw University in, in 2025, it will be second, it, it will be 20 anniversary of his death, a small board on his memory. That's my, my wish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before we proceed to questions, there is one announcement from Krzysztof Turzyński. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very rarely I'm uh, much intimidated in announcing uh, um, distinction for a lecturer. Uh, this is because when I was a student, I skipped my other classes at the Faculty of Physics to attend Professor Hennel's lecture, which was a popular lecture, and thus non, not obligatory for me. And um, Professor Hennel returned to the Faculty of Physics uh, to deliver a series of lectures about uh, Nobel Prize winners and Nobel nominated from uh, the Republic of Poland. And uh, this uh, lecture was very, uh, very praised by the students in the student surveys that are uh, evaluated at the end of each semester. And uh, Professor Hennel uh, was nominated for the Dean's Distinction um, uh, for the best lecture at the Faculty of Physics. We always announce uh, who is on the shortlist to give the stellar, stellar examples of the lecturers to the uh, community of the Faculty of Physics and uh, to uh, honor uh, everyone who's so excellent at their teaching activity. Uh, this is why I would like to uh, ask Professor Dariusz Wasik, the Dean of the Faculty of Physics, to present a congratulatory letter to Professor Hennel. Dziękuję. Bardzo mi miło. Questions. As a matter of fact, maybe it's not a question, but I would like to mention that uh, Professor Robert Rodblat 
was engaged and was working on the field of application of physics in biology and medicine. As Professor Hennel mentioned, she was also the editor of the journal Physics in Biology and Medicine. And also, he kept the contact with uh, Polish uh, scientists. And uh, he was a supervisor of my habilitation. Uh, it was uh, the, the theme of, of my habilitation was rather new uh, at, uh, at that time at the Faculty of Physics. So it was not so easy to find a proper advisor because, uh, uh, as I told, mentioned, my habitation concerned the application of physics in biology and medicine, and especially the application of the signal, biological and uh, medical signal analysis. So maybe these uh, connections between Poland and around the blood were, in fact, uh, quite tight in the 70s and 80s. Thank you. Other questions? Maybe I... Uh... I have a comment. You mentioned Barn, who refused to participate in the Manhattan Project. Yeah. But I don't know whether all of you know that Barn was a great mathematician and physicist, and he was visited in Göttingen uh, before the Second World War by nearly all the uh, uh, men who created atomic bombs in the United States, in the Soviet Union, and in China. Uh, of course, they, they were not discussing the atomic bomb, but they were just discussing quantum mechanics and the new uh, physics. And Oppenheimer was the PhD student of uh, Born. They were not very on very well uh, terms because Oppenheimer was absolutely unbearable man. But uh, anyway, he was a PhD student of Born and there are some important uh, ideas that still to now in, uh, have names of Born Oppenheimer. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, Max Born place of work. At that time, it was the center of physical world. Other questions? If I may add, add a comment, not a question. Uh, that there is a person, a, a physicist, originally from Hungary, but American citizen later on, Leo Szilard whose life looks somewhat similar to that life. Initially, he was also very much interested in nuclear physics. May claim to be the first to predict the chain reaction. Yeah, exactly. Right? He, and he, he predicted was, chain reaction and, and he immediately made a, a patent. Right, right. He had British patent on the subject. Right. So he collaborated with Fermi, right? And, and then he participated in Manhattan Project, and later on was very active in Pagwash movement. And later on very much active also in uh, applications of physics to medicine and biology. So. Because of his illness also. That's right. That's he right. was, he had lung cancer, was taken to hospital <coughs> for uh, radiation treatment. He asked for the program of the treatment said, it's not good, I will make it better. Yeah. And he prepared detailed program and finally he did not die because of cancer, but some heart problems many years later. Right. If I may ask, uh, when he left in 39, was it only scientific reasons or also political? You know, did he realize the threat or? Sorry, sorry. When Rothblatt left Poland in 1939. He was after PhD thesis and he was going to learn new things in So it was not, not political yet? No, 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 not at okay, all. Okay, thank you. 
Andrzej Wróblewski wanted to say. Just a small comment, uh, namely that uh, Rothblatt's uh, connection with Faculty of Physics uh, pre-war and after war was rather circumstantial. Um, he was an assistant of uh, Wertenstein at this uh, uh, radiological laboratory. And uh, very surprisingly, he did not participate in nuclear physics uh, studies at Hoja which were at that time uh, done by Andrzej Sotan. Andrzej Sotan was the first uh, Polish nuclear physicist trained at Pasadena in the early 30s. And then when he returned to Poland, uh, he built the first uh, accelerator at Hoja Street. In 1937, it was ready. And Wertenstein, who was the chief of radiological laboratory and head of, of, of this laboratory, uh, head of Rotzblatt's also, uh, very readily joined Sotan to make nuclear studies using these accelerators. They even published papers together, so Rotzblatt and Wertenstein. And surprisingly, uh, Rotzblatt uh, never uh, felt uh, to be connected somehow in the, with this project. And moreover, in his memoirs, uh, he maintained that in Polish, in Poland at that time there was no accelerator, which was for me what was surprising. I was asked to, 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 to read the manuscript of this book by Marek Gurlikowski, and this is a statement that he said, I have to go to England because in Poland there are no accelerators and, and I have to, to build one. This was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, surprising for me. Uh, his attitude to Hoja Street a laboratory before the war. And after the war, of course, um, he was very helpful in, uh, in uh, somehow um, helping Marian Danish and, uh, and Jerzy Pniewski when they were sent to England by Pinikowski. Uh, they both uh, uh, were very grateful to Rodblad because he somehow facilitated their arrival and, and uh, later studies. Uh, but uh, that was all. And Pniewski, for example, uh, who was also a crystal character, as you know, uh, somehow never felt uh, readiness to be connected with this Pagwash uh, meeting. Uh, so their acquaintance was, was also quite circumstantial. Uh, I met Rothblatt uh, in, in Warsaw in 1995, when he, he, there was a the big ceremony. Uh, oh, Maria, Curie, uh, Maria Skłodowska Curie, I talked to him. Uh, he was quite a nice man, uh, spoke Polish as <laughs> similar to as was uh, told and uh, shown in this uh, small picture. Now, uh, my comment is because of your appeal that we should have uh, a plague um, in, in physics department or physics faculty. For all that, I'm not convinced that uh, their arguments are so strong. Uh, there is a plate uh, at the Auditorium Maximum um, showing his uh, connection to Warsaw University, uh, but uh, somehow I am I'm doubtful if he even ever visited Hoja Street. Hoja Street, because he visited Warsaw several times, of course. Before the war, probably he did not visit Hoja Street at all contrary to Wertenstein, who was working there even. So, so this is uh, uh, quite uncertain for me. This, and I, would, I would not support uh, this move to, to, to have a plague uh, for Rothblatt uh, for, for, for in 19, uh, 2025. Uh, in his documents, Rothblatt uh, has written that Wertenstein sent him to Liverpool to learn how to build an accelerator. And I, it looks for me that maybe between Sultan and Wertenstein there was a kind of competition. No, Don't you think so? Friends. They were friends, they collaborated, they published papers together. Uh, but really sending Rosberg to Liverpool, he talked <laughs> with him about accelerator. I don't know exactly, but I think that uh, not going into all the details, 
there are not so many people we can be proud of. And uh, that's my position that... But by the way, the building which which belonged to the Pshachnitsa before the war is across the street. Yeah, it's it's mm. mathematics department uh -huh. nowadays, right? Uh. I have nothing against. Okay, I think it's time to finish. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. See you next semester.